Welcome everyone to uh, the podcasts for Jack EP. Um, this is for HRS 2025, and we are presenting some of the very interesting papers and posters that are being uh, d discussed at the meeting. And this will be uh, released with the um, simultaneous publication of the paper. So we're going to be discussing today irrigation of pulsed field ablation electrodes mitigates joule heating and heat stacking phenomenon. And this is being presented by my boss, Will Sauer, um, who's the chief of the electrophysiology division at Brigham and Women's Hospital. Uh, Will, do you want to tell us a little bit about the paper and uh, the rationale behind the study? Uh, yeah, of course. Um, well, first of all, thank you um, for inviting me to the podcast. Um, this uh, will be presented on Friday at HRS, and it'll be a simultaneous publication with and Jack EP. Um, this started out because um, the uh, Nate Steiger and uh, Daniel Campos and I were trying to brainstorm on ways we could measure heating uh, on PFA electrodes. You know, we were all told that PFA works in a non-thermal manner, but we felt like there had to be some heating of the electrodes because they're getting, you know, 2000 volts. And when there was a signal for increased neurovascular events with one of the catheters, we hypothesized that it could have been from inadequate uh, cooling of the of those electrodes. And so uh, we devised this experiment where we um, use an in vitro model with a potato. And we um, kind of had it on a platform and like an infinity pool where the catheter was just kind of submerged just a little bit, just enough for the electrodes just to be buried in, in, a, in the saline. And then we used a thermal camera that captures the highest temperature in the field uh, at a rate of uh, nine frames per second. And by doing this, we were able to see that these electrodes do indeed, indeed heat, um, but we were also able to show that the electrodes um, are when we actively irrigate them, they remain cool. So just taking you through this poster, and for those of, a, for those of the listeners that are, are not here, I'm, I'm displaying a poster that was, was presented at HRS. It's hard to speak in the, in the future about this, but will be presented at HRS, but by the time you listen to this, has been presented. Um, and we did this experiment where we tried to stack lesions, and so, uh, we delivered energy. Well, maybe I should pause and just ask you, Dr. Tadro, um, what if any questions so far. Yeah, I think that it would be helpful to know, you know, when we think about pulsed field ablation, we don't usually think about heating and we think about it as non-thermal ablation. And what are some of the features of maybe an electrode or a delivery location that might be thought to contribute to heating if it were to occur? Um, yeah, so uh, that's a good point. We don't think about that heating that can occur. One of the things that we found was that the whole bath would heat after like a day of experiments on PFA. And that's when we started realizing that there was a significant amount of heating. And I think that it's just a physical phenomenon where you have joule heating, meaning the metal itself gets hot whenever you deliver electricity. And we see this through any type of resistive heating. The difference with pulse field ablation and say, I don't know, an electric stove, for example, is that it's just for an instant. You get you know, less than 100 microseconds of energy delivered in different pulses. But what happens is there's kind of, the first pulse doesn't necessarily heat the electrode. It's just that you get packets of energy you know, three pulses in a row, and then some operators may choose to stack lesions. And so you'll get three pulses in a row, and then three pulses in a row, and then three pulses in a row. And that's really where we started to see the heating occur. So in this graph that's on the poster, that's exactly what we did. We, we did three in a row. And when we had four milliliters per minute cooling the electrodes of this variable loop circular catheter. This is the varipulse catheter. Um, 
we saw that immediately the temperature rocketed up to around 60 degrees. And then the second round, it went up a little higher. And the third round, it's averaged out about 70. But actually, we, we routinely saw some temperatures hit 80. And we just think that the resolution of our thermal camera is not quite what it needs to be in order to get a more accurate reading. But we know that it got hot. Now, that is in stark contrast to what we see with the uh, 30 milliliters per minute, where we had a nice, cool baseline that stayed cool the entire time. And when we delivered three uh, uh, pulse field ablation applications in a row, it stayed cool. Average was around 38 degrees. So, you know, I think this is going to probably, I think this should affect practice. If you're going to stack lesions, if you're going to use this catheter, um, you know, it should be noted that in the clinical trials, uh, the lesions were, the lesions were delivered in the pulmonary veins or around the pulmonary veins where there's a fair amount of passive heating, cooling, if there is uh, heating of the electrodes. But, you know, sometimes we'll deliver energy on the posterior wall or we'll have to deliver energy more than once or right away. And so I would recommend going to 30 milliliters per minute if, if uh, the operators are going to do that. And I've done that on cases uh, since this research has come out. One thing I was wondering about this research is, do you think it's the time between the applications that's the important thing or the multiple deliveries in the same location that's important? Yeah, um, both. So one of the things is in, in this particular model, there's no passive cooling. So if we were to move the catheter, I think that that would um, contribute to cooling and we wouldn't see such a, a huge heating effect. Um, I think there's something about just keeping the catheter in place, delivering it over and over again with those stacked lesions that, yeah, you do um, heat up the, the electrode and there is the stacking effect, but you also deprive the electrode from uh, getting some passive cooling with just the movement. And so that, I think that that accentuates it if, you, if you're keeping it in the same spot over and over again. Absolutely. I mean, I think this is a great example of a relatively simple experiment that that exhibits or demonstrates a, a, a concept that's really, like you said, it's likely to change practice. It may change how people choose to use this catheter. It would be really interesting to see similar results for other post field catheters that are out there. You know, it makes you wonder. Um, would smaller electrode catheters have different results? Larger electrode catheters have different results. Yeah, I think you're right because we are adapting a lot of our radio frequency ablation catheters into this sort of dual energy. And um, I think that, you know, for all the same reasons we cool the electrodes for radio frequency ablation, we should probably consider that also for pulse field ablation. Um, other catheters may have different designs, like, for example, the mesh or um, that the flower design that may allow for a more effective passive cooling. And the truth is, this experiment basically gives the worst possible case scenario clinically. It's a catheter in a, in a you know, a pool of saline with zero cooling effect and without any movement. I don't, I think that that doesn't really correlate with the clinical circumstances we're using this catheter in. And I think it accentuates kind of the worst case scenario, as I said, but it is important to note that the electrodes do in fact heat. And I think we need to be aware of that, um, especially if we're seeing any kind of signal for char or anything that could be explained by that excessive heating. Absolutely. Well, this is congratulations on a great poster. I think like we were talking about, it's the shortest time from inception to demonstration of a biophysical effect. Um, and we look forward to seeing the poster at HRS. Thanks very much, Dr. Tedro. And uh, I'm uh, happy to talk to everybody who may have interest in this. Thank you very much.